In the history of God's people, uh, right, right through the time of the Old and, and New Testament, there have been times of blessing for God's people and times of discipline. And one of the times of discipline for God's people were when the Jews were exiled. And I thought it might be a fitting time for us to reflect uh, during this last season. So uh, many of you will know the story of the Jewish exile. They had been warned about taking God for granted, disobeying God, and you know they'd, they'd been doing the wrong thing. And, and prophets would come and tell them, you know, God's going to judge you, you're doing the wrong thing, he's going to discipline you. And they'll persecute the prophets for saying it. You know, we're, we're children of Abraham, God won't hurt us. And uh, sometimes they even killed them, uh, roughly treated them. And so these, these messages were, were just not received very well at all. And so because they didn't listen, God raised up the Babylonians. Now earlier, the, the northern tribes, the tribes of Israel had been carried off, but God raised up the Babylonians and they came and three times they, they, they destroyed Jerusalem and carried off all the nobles, uh, killed all, all the warriors and and carried the people off into captivity. That's what the Babylonians did. They grabbed people in the cream of the crop and they, they took them back to Babylon and assimilate them into their, their own culture. And we read in the Bible there's a 40-year period of them living in this time, give or take a, a few years, depending on when the groups returned. And one of the things we read about when they're in this exile is that they could not worship. Now you have to understand worship for the Jews was about the temple, it was about sacrifices. Singing too, like we do, but they had sacrifices and they had the temple and all of that. And they couldn't do that, they couldn't do any of that. They, they, God was present in the temple in the Old Testament, so they couldn't even approach God. They could pray, but they, they couldn't really be them. They couldn't experience their worship as, as they'd known it. And so we have these Israelites, these, these Jewish people uh, in exile, just ripped away from everything they knew. And it's expressed really well in Psalm 137. You'll know these verses pretty well. Psalm 137, beside the rivers of Babylon, we sat and wept as we thought of Jerusalem. We put away our harps, hanging them on the branches of poplar trees. For our captors demanded a song from us. Our tormentors insisted on a joyful hymn. Sing us one of those songs of Jerusalem. But how can we sing the songs of the Lord while in a pagan land? If I forget you, O Jerusalem, let my right hand forget how to play the harp. In Psalm 137. By the rivers of Babylon we wept. And you can feel the despair in the psalm, we can't even sing. We can't play our instruments. We've hung them up. We've given it up. We can't worship. We can't bring joy to our lives while we're in this foreign land full of pagans. Do you feel their hopelessness? And yet, this was God's doing. Now, we, we find this really, really hard to understand, especially in our modern times. That such hardship could possibly be God's doing seems unthinkable for us to imagine that a loving God would do that. But there they were, in the middle of a pagan land, unable to worship, being prevented from enjoying the worship of one another, and that was God's will for them. That was God's doing. I think sometimes it takes a loss to really appreciate what you had. Sometimes we take things for granted so much, we become used to things so much, even the greatest blessings, that we don't really come to appreciate them until that point where they're taken away, where we lose them. They had taken the grace of God for granted. They lived selfish lives, indulging in sin, not taking God's laws seriously. After exile, when they returned, they were much more careful to respect God. Now this year we've experienced a loss like we never have before. 
How often in the history of the Christian church has the church actually been ordered not to gather? Not very often. It's a rare time for a government to say to us, you can't meet. Extremely rare. And so for over the last three and a half months, we have lost the opportunity to meet together, to sing songs together, to worship together. The comfort of a hug, the fellowship of grouping, corporate prayer, all those things were taken away from us in some measure. Now, I know that the COVID pandemic is not the same as the exile, and I wouldn't even begin to suggest that. It hasn't been overly long, really. For the exiles, it was 40 years. But to us, something has been taken away. Not being allowed to meet, not being able to use our spiritual gifts and serve in the normal way, out of routine. Not to mention the other things, too, like the panic buying, the not being able to find things at the shop, the, the, you know, that sort of stuff, the loss of income for some. And that's been frightening. And the fear, you know, the, these financial predictions that the world's going to crash and we're all going to go into recession, all of that's been a part of it. The fragmentation of societies, borders closed. That's never happened in the history of Federation that states have closed their borders. Borders have closed, there's frustration brewing, it bubbles over into riots and, and people fragment and it's just yuck, yuck, yuck. But in all of this, what has God been teaching us? What has God been doing? And that's why we've added this segment to our church service for the next few weeks. What has God been teaching us? Because we don't want to go through the last three and a half months not having learnt a thing. We want to capture that. And so I'm not going to go into it in great detail now, but I will mention just where we're going to be heading uh, over the next few weeks in terms of those lessons. The first one, as I mentioned, we've learned the importance of meeting together. There is something powerful in that. And we don't want to lose it. Perhaps we're taking it for granted sometimes. You know, we often hear in prayer meetings, Lord, thank you that we have the freedom to worship together. You, you often hear that prayer? Well, we didn't. <laughs> Maybe we appreciate that more now. As good as technology is, there is no substitute for physical meeting. We're glad of the technology and it was helpful, but there's no substitute for physical presence. We've learned in this journey that programs are the, not the most important thing in the church, but relationships are, because programs can be taken away. The relationships are the most important thing. We've learned the, how important some aspects of church life actually are. The importance of growth groups, for one. They came right into their own in this time. Very, very important. The importance of staff. You know, the investing in staff that, that we can run things. The importance of the bookstore, as we mentioned. We've learned that when our programs and service are taken away, it can reveal how strong or how weak our personal faith in God actually is. Is our relationship with God real or do we only connect with God through the programs of the church? You'll find that out pretty quickly when you can't meet in programs together. Not only we learned some of these lessons, but we've also seen clearly how God actually prepared us in advance for this. Very early on, the leaders sat down and we went through all of the decisions we've made in the last 18 months and watched how God has actually prepped us for this time. For example, mid-year retreat last year. The elders and leaders, we had a retreat in the middle of the year and we made some decisions about some certain things. One of those decisions was the importance of the bookshop. Now, the bookshop as a business doesn't run overly well. It doesn't always break even. And we made a decision back then that we would make it not fail. We would support it no matter what as a ministry to the town. What a good decision that was, not to close it or do anything like that, because in hindsight, how valuable it's been. Then Jessica resigned toward the end of last year and it threw us up, but our decision to put Jared on was the exact right one for this time. I don't know if there's anyone that could have done it like Jared has done it. 
I work with him every day watching what he does and I can tell you that we would have been stuck if it wasn't for him and God set that in motion earlier. Also at the beginning of this year, rather than embark on any big project, we decide as a leadership team this will be a year of rest and consolidation. So it's really cool because we've got nothing to lose. We've lost nothing because we didn't plan anything anyway. And the stuff that we were planning to do can all be done um, in, in the office environment. So can you see? Can you see that God, see, God saw this coming and he, he moved us as a leadership team to make certain key decisions that would ensure that when this time did come, things would be okay. Many of the pastors I've spoken to over the time, I'll tell you what, I've had so many Zoom meetings, I'm sick of looking at screens, I've got to tell you. But I've met with a lot of pastors over this time, senior pastors from around the country, and they're all saying the same thing. God is up to something. God is doing something around the world with his church. He's shaking us up. He's shaking up the world and he's preparing us for something. God is on the move and something is going to happen and he's, so he saw this coming, he knows what's going to happen and he's preparing us for something. This is why the church around the world seems to be at peace. Whenever I talk to people, you know, who, who are involved in church, they're not worried really. There's a sense among us that God is doing something here. Something God's is, it's all okay. Many, many of you that I talk to, there's peace in you. God is preparing something. As I meet with our leadership, and we've kept meeting, we, we hadn't stopped over the time, there's enthusiasm and anticipation and peace among them, among our leaders. They just know that God's in control. Something's happening. There is frustration, I'll admit that. But there is peace with God because we know he's up to something. Because in the middle of turmoil, God speaks. And that's our question. What is actually God saying? What has God been saying? The Israelites were broken as a result of God's discipline. They were captives in a foreign land. They'd lost everything. But in their situation and despair, in the middle of their, what will we do? In the middle of their low point, God speaks something into them. He speaks peace into the exiles. And though they've been forced away from everything they knew and had lost things, God gives them hope. And that's what I want us to learn today, that God speaks promises. When we're in a low point, God speaks promises. You've got to look for those. And I want to take you to Isaiah 51, where these promises are expressed to God. So if you've got your Bibles there and you want to look, look it up, Isaiah chapter 51. And I'm just going to um, pick out just a few verses. It's a good chapter to read, but I just want to highlight a few verses. Isaiah chapter 51, verses 4 to 11. Listen to me, my people. Hear me, Israel, for my law will be proclaimed and my justice will become a light to the nations. You've got to keep in mind that they're in the middle of a pagan land where their religion is squashed. This is what God is saying. My mercy and justice are coming soon. My salvation is on the way. My strong arm will bring justice to all the nations. All distant lands will look to me and wait in hope for my powerful arm. Look up to the skies above and gaze down on the earth below, for the skies will disappear like smoke and the earth will wear out like a piece of clothing. And the people of the earth will die like flies, but my salvation lasts forever. My righteousness will rule, will never end. Listen to me, you who know right from wrong, you who cherish my law in your hearts. Do not be afraid of people's scorn, nor fear their insults. For the moth will devour them as it devours clothing. The worm will eat them as it eats wool. But my righteousness will last forever. My salvation will continue from generation to generation. Wake up. Wake up, O Lord. Clothe yourselves with strength with yourself with strength, 
Flex your mighty right arm. Rouse yourself as in the days of old when you slew Egypt, the dragon of the Nile. Are you not the same today, the one who dried up the sea, making a path of escape through the depths so that your people could cross over? Those who have been ransomed by the Lord will return. They will enter Jerusalem singing, crowned with everlasting joy, as sorrow and mourning will disappear and they will be filled with joy and gladness. One of the truths that God has always wanted his people to understand is that he is always in control. Though from our point of view, it might not feel like it, God is always in control. You see, because we, we measure everything by the immediate, what we're going through, what we're feeling. How do I feel about this season? But God is in control of all that. He sees it, even though we don't. The funny thing is our mood about God can change several times a day, depending on where, <laughs> what we're feeling. God is way more constant than that. Now, even though it doesn't feel like God's in control sometimes, he does hold everything in his hand. And I want to just highlight those verses. Vice verses 5 and 6, that he speaks to the people in the middle of their despair. This is what he says, My mercy and justice are coming soon. My salvation is on the way. It's been how long? I don't know. My strong arm will bring justice to the nations. All distant lands will look to me and wait and hope. Look up to the skies above and gaze down to the earth below for the skies will disappear like smoke and the earth will wear out like a piece of cloth. The people on the earth will die like flies but my salvation lasts forever. My righteous rule will never end. My salvation lasts forever. He is in control. God's plan to restore his people was always there. We rarely see the big picture. That's why faith in God is so important, because we can't see. We can't see the future, but he can. And he understands how it all fits together. It's like the difference between a navigator and a driver. On a big ship, for example, the navigator knows the course to plot. He has the chart in front of him. The pilot only sees to the horizon, but the navigator sees the big picture. Like the rally car drivers, you know, those navigators, turn now. And it might be a hill or something, the driver can't see, he just turns because the navigator tells him to, right? Because he's got the map in front of him, he can see it. You have to trust the map and the navigator, otherwise you just wander around, going around in circles everywhere. Avoiding rough times, you know, looking for the easy times. You just go all over the place. But God has the map and he guides us. He knows what he's doing. He's always in charge. The Jews were in exile, but they had to trust that God had not forgotten them. And the longer that went on, the harder that was. The earth and sky will disappear, God says, but his plans will remain forever. Then he gives them a vision of the future. He gives them a little glimpse of what's going to happen in the future. In the middle of their pain and suffering, he gives them a little spotlight, just a pinprick of an idea of what might happen or what is going to happen in the middle. And he does that because we have to remember that our experiences in life are only temporary. Life is a journey of ups and downs. Every season will pass, but we are heading somewhere and God gives us a glimpse even though it's hard to see it fully he gives us a glimpse look at what he said to the captives those who have been ransomed by the lord will return it's a beautiful promise you will return they will enter jerusalem with singing can you can you see the picture of jerusalem's high up right so you're going up the road up to jerusalem is see the hill and the temple you know, they'll return, they'll enter Jerusalem singing, crowned with everlasting joy. Sorrow and mourning will disappear and they'll be filled with joy and gladness. He gives them a vision. And I want to say boldly that he's done the same for us. He's given us a vision of the future. No matter how we feel in our physical body, no matter what we experience in our relationships, no matter how things are working out, no matter how poorly they are working out, 
God has a vision for you of the future and it is glorious and wonderful. He gives them a vision of entering Jerusalem again. A beautiful picture of singing and praise. Perhaps it would be more familiar to you if I read this same verse in the King James. Therefore the redeemed of the Lord shall return and come with singing unto Zion and everlasting joy will be upon their head. They shall obtain gladness and joy and sorrow and mourning will flee away. Sound familiar to you? What a beautiful promise for those experiencing the trauma of captivity. A vision of God's salvation. Whatever life brings us, we have the promise of the salvation of the Lord Jesus Christ. There is an eternal blessing for those who trust in his promises, no matter what happens. Now, I know for many of us at the moment, the world seems like it's in turmoil. Look around. I mean, it looks really bad when you, you watch the news, which you probably shouldn't do, but when you do... It just looks bad. And to some extent it is kind of messed up. And that might cause some to worry, even fall into depression sometimes. But that is why it's important to hold on to the promise God gives us. Like the exiles in Babylon, God also gives us a vision of the future. I want to read it to you in Revelation chapter 21. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the old heaven and the old earth had disappeared and the sea was also gone. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem coming down from God out of heaven like a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. I heard a loud shout from the throne saying, look, God's home is now among his people. He will live with them and they will be his people and God himself will be with them. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or sorrow or crying or pain. All these things are gone forever. And the one sitting on the throne said, look, I am making everything new. And then he said to me, write this down for what I tell you is trustworthy and true. And he also said, it is finished. I am the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end to all who are thirsty. I will give freely from the springs of the water of life. All who are victorious will inherit all of these blessings and I will be their God and they will be my children. That is God's glimpse for us. A picture of the future that we can hang on to. It might feel like we're in exile of some kind. Trapped here in physical bodies that get old. In a world where society is going all messy, we feel yuck in it. And God gives us this picture. And I hope that during this season, that we have learned that everything in life is so incredibly fragile. Anything can be taken away from us in a moment, but God is constant. No matter what is happening around us, God remains the constant. Thing. Anywhere, anything we work hard for can be taken away. But the effort we make in clinging to the eternal God is not a wasted effort. The time we commit in deepening our love for him is good time and worthy of our attention. People may let us down, but God never will. And in seeking him, we're building an eternal relationship with our Heavenly Father, we're investing into a spiritual family that can never be taken away. And so this year, that's our theme. Walk with God. Walk with Him. And if this season's taught you anything else, hopefully it's taught you that. That in walking with Him, you have something that can never be lost, never taken away. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your enduring promises, the love you showed us in history, but in future as well. That you have laid out for us a salvation plan that is far more beautiful than anything that we could imagine. 
And in this world, Lord, though we have to suffer things, you have for us a glorious promise that will one day result in great joy and wonderful peace. We thank you for that. Lord, we take what we have learned during this season and we embrace you again, thanking you for all that you give us. We trust you that you are in charge, you know what you're doing and that you see more than we can see. And so we give our lives to you. We choose to walk with you every day for your glory and for the future. Amen.